puppies. It's what's for breakfast. Welcome to Have Movies Will Game, the only podcast on the globe where we take you, our friendly listener, through the best and worst movies of yesterday and today, and then discuss ways that you can play them at your gaming table. In every episode, our intrepid hosts, Matthew, Dusty, and Nathaniel, will filibuster fondly over facts and feelings of your favorite films, and then get to the glorious gaming goodness, giving Game Masters great gimmicks on generating golden genius. Have Movies Will Game, brought to you through the electronic wonder of the internet. Now, let's start the show! Oh, God, this movie. <laughs> it's classic. This was not the one I put in, but I'm really glad it, this was the one that won. Um, what By the way, uh, I'm, I'm Matthew. And I'm Dusty. And I'm Nathaniel. And we actually, I think, did that sooner than we've ever done it. I, I <laughs> tried not to forget this time. <laughs> we normally go, I think, fi- about five minutes into the show before we say, oh, yeah, by the way. Chaos, anarchy, I'm striking a blow for freedom. <laughs> Hell, Cats and dogs living together. Sometimes we haven't even done it until the very end. <laughs> I think that happened once or twice, yeah. yeah. And this is Half Movies Will Game, which our good announcer, Isaac, probably already told you about a few moments earlier. So, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I was just Silence. thinking about Isaac because I, 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 you know, I, I follow him on Facebook. Same here, yeah. yeah. So, that song, the song at the very beginning. Mm-hmm. Oh, the one of our podcast or the one of the movie? The the one in the movie. Oh, yes. Yes. It's it I have heard, stuck in your head. I have heard yeah. so many iterations of that song, but I'd never heard the actual original. It's really good. It's really thank good. You, you can thank you, Mr. Ennio Morricone, for that one. I hope you get that name right. Is I he alive or is he going to write us angry letters? Probably write us angry okay. letters from, from if he's dead. Yeah. Anyways. Well, yeah, that is one of the most redone at Bits yeah. of cinematic music ever. Do we get angry letters? We don't. Can get I read them? Any letters. No, I don't think we get anything <laughs> like that. Man, fuck you guys. Write us angry letters. <laughs> and you can send I those you to and your Matthew ugly. at <laughs> halfmoviesbookgame. I am angry at, at halfgames. Whatever. <laughs> that may be why we don't get letters. <laughs> <laughs> do we actually have? I don't we, think we, we do. Each, we do have individual email addresses, so you could all email oh, us at do, do I? Dusty Matthew I've never even looked at NPC it. at halfmovieswillgame.com. We, okay. Email us. Let us know what you think. And if we don't Or just them, tell us to go fuck ourselves. Yeah, I mean, we whatever. will by the time this airs. <laughs> <laughs> you can't see this, but he's writing a note. <laughs> note to self. <laughs> Double okay. check. So immediately while watching the intro, I, I noticed uh, Script Girl. There, there is a there was like maybe thirty people. It's an older movie, so mm-hmm. they they get a lot of the credits out of the way at the front. Yeah, and there's something called a script girl. And she I didn't want really have much of a job in this movie. I did think she? that's I now mean, the that's... equivalent of script supervisor. Okay, you sit there like uh, I, I I dated someone that was a script supervisor for for about a year and a half, two years. And she said, you basically sit next to the director and you hope, hold open the script and you're reading line for line. It's a moving podium? Basically. And oh. when somebody screws up, they would stop and say, you're off your line. Unless the director gave them credence to ad lib, like uh, a couple of times in this movie. Credence to ad lib? Yeah, I had that the album. ability to ad lib. Yeah. Not credence to Clearwater Revival, anything like that. The credence to. That's not the right word, man. <laughs> I had his. I don't actually Google? know if that's the word. <laughs> that's not the right word. We will, we will look it up later. We will later. look that up later. No. I'm sure. You will send us emails. <laughs> <laughs> With the music, though, I do want to go back to that. All I, of the music was good, not just the main yeah. thing. Oh, God. From beginning to end, all the music was good. But each of the characters, I think, I got the feeling that they each had their own themes. Mm. It was all one overarching piece, but mm-hmm. yeah, they each had a theme within the piece. Yeah. All I remember is that Tuco the hero of the movie fuck yeah tuco was the hero of the <laughs> tuco movie. was awesome all of his were choral he had yeah. the, the choir um i forget what the other two had i just noticed his most because they weren't instruments they were yeah. the actual choir of tuco was definitely the main character the the protagonist um the Oops. rest of them were almost npcs i mean there was no character development they they didn't have a story arc 
nothing ever really happened to them that made them grow or change or or devolve or anything. They were just archetypes that were there. Well, how many times have you played or run a game where most of the players were also that? They had no Not background. They were probably <laughs> just many, there many times to be the man with no name. Just an NPC. The yeah. man with no name is the most one of the most classic gaming archetypes ever. And we owe Clint Eastwood, actually we owe Toshiro Mafune for this character. Role. Let's talk about that for a second, because my first introduction to early uh I guess samurai films was through you. And I I felt that this shared a lot of elements with um, 13 like those, Samurai? Yeah, those those old Samurai or 13 movies. Assassins. 13 right. Assassins. And uh, and this is the spaghetti Western subgenre of Western, I guess. I mean... So the spaghetti Western genre, from my understanding of my own fandom, which crosses over it, is that it was rooted with Sergio Leone, mm-hmm. starting with Fistful of Dollars, who made it as... Uh, and that, if we had done that, there's a whole lot to talk about. We could talk about that one for days. But his background with that one is that it was essentially a remake of Akira Kurosawa's film Yojimbo, which means bodyguard. That's the one with the rabbit. In which, well, Stan Sakai made a comic book character, uh, a comic book series called Usagi Yojimbo, rabbit bodyguard, about a character named Miyamoto Usagi. Which brings us to the Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles. brings us to the Ninja Turtles, (laughs) and suddenly the circle is now complete. But... The man with no name, Clint Eastwood's character in the Sergio Leone movie, um, Fistful of Dollars, it, it get, play was Toshiro Mufune's character, the Yojimbo in the movie Yojimbo, where he, this drifter samurai, ex samurai Ronin, comes into this town. He's broke, he needs work, and he sees that these two gangs are fighting against each other. So he just, and they're ruining the town. So he just pits them against each other, wipes them both out in the process and then moves on. Mm -hmm. You never know his name. You never know anything about him. He is essentially the man with no name, which Clint Eastwood turned into his signature character. But the thing that, that, Leon did with with this movie, uh, even though the, the main theme uh, on on his movies for the spaghetti western genre is an emphasis on violence, uh, it's also that American deconstructionism of like old west romanticism, which we had with John Wayne. Like there was always the hero that walked in and walked to the sunset. The good and the bad and the ugly was actually supposed to be uh, a satire of the American western genre. Like, even um, John Wayne was pissed off about this movie. John Wayne can eat a dick. Yeah, I know. Because (laughs) Clint Eastwood, like, there was a conversation some another director had with John Wayne about this movie. And that initially John Wayne was given, was wanted to have the role of of Clint Eastwood's character for for when uh, Leon went to him and said, hey, I want you to do this because you're big in Westerns. And he said, no. Another director was talking to John Wayne about it and said, well... Uh, John Wayne said the reason why I didn't want to take this character was because he shoots people in the back and I, I, an American <laughs> cowboy would never do that. The fuck you and say? The, and the director was like, well, Clint Eastwood would shoot someone in the back. And John Wayne is on record as saying, well, I don't give a fuck what that kid does and like turned around and walked away. Ooh, I sent some old school rivalry there. <laughs> well, this is the third movie where Clint Eastwood played the same character. But it's a prequel to the the whole set. Yeah. Yeah. This is filmed, the third film. Yeah. But is it the same a prequel. characters over? Or? Yeah. It's, it's the same. It's, well, it's technically, him, it's the as same. As the man character. with no name. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Because this, this they is, call him Blondie, but that's not his name. That's just yeah. what they call him because he's got the blonde hair. Yeah. And this is where he picks up the, the poncho, which you see yeah, in, yeah. The, in the later movies. Yeah. So yeah. I, this is off topic, but I recently sure. just got a 4K TV mm-hmm. to go with my own. Oh, very nice. 4K Xbox One X. Mm-hmm. Yeah. It's very nice. Oh, you got the X. Nice. I can count the nostril hair. <laughs> um, so i rented this on amazon and yeah. i watched it on my not 4k but still hd tv and it was gorgeous i, yeah. I have a blu-ray this copy of it yeah old it's... old film and you can watch it in the corners and you can see where it was transferred over i have to say that it, it held up well film transfers very nicely to hd and i just want to make sure we're all on the same page this time we all watched the extended version with the three hours scenes, three right? hours yeah fuck yeah yeah Two right hours, on. 58 minutes. Yep. This is usually when we watch something where there's been alternate versions. We all get a different we're one. We're not quite in sync. But this time we we watched, the, we got the full experience. There was the uh, initial Italian or uh, international version, which was like two hours, 38 minutes. There was the U.S. theatrical version, which was just a hair over two hours. And then there was the 
the remastered version that was set for DVD which and Blu-ray, which we all watched, which is two hours, 58 minutes. Now, Leone, this was not the last time that happened to him. If you ever watched... Um, Oh God! His nope. his next series of movies, Once Upon a Time in America. Yes, Once which, Upon a Time in the West, and then Once Upon a Time in America. Once Upon a Time in America had the same thing, where it was the international version was almost twice as long as the version that released in America. It's a great movie. The version that was released in America was critically panned, but then those critics, when they saw the full international version, were like, "This is a masterpiece." Yeah. I, you know, honestly, I had a moment where I was like, what is going on? Because we did watch the extended. And my first note is apparently everyone is mute in the old West. (laughs) Oh, that first 10 and a half minutes of no dialogue. then, Then my next note is, and apparently no one blinks. And then my third note is. 10 minutes and 35 seconds until the first line. <laughs> he, he only does that. Yeah. I, actually, films, I, I don't, this is my first yeah. exposure to him. So um, He loves those long build up where you can basically, you get these close up shots of people's faces. It, the face but, off at the end. Fantastic for use fact, of that. His, yeah, exactly. His portrayal of the gunfighters and these these characters in in these situations has become canon. I has think become canon with the context yeah, of I've seen the it. gunfight. The, the the itchy yeah. fingers on the gun belt moving forward, he and then the zoom yeah, yeah. in yeah. of the yeah. faces to kind of yeah. get the flared nostrils. No, I've, yeah. I've seen that in a lot of other things, and this is probably the beginning of the genesis of it. If you ever want to see him truly in work in a masterpiece moment. Uh, a follow-up to this. Now, this was the last of the original trilogy. Of the dollars, but then he yeah. made others, and the, his what people consider his masterpiece. We actually should have put on the list is "Once Upon a Time in the West." The opening sequence to that is considered one of the greatest opening sequences to a movie of all time, complete with the point that it basically is ten whole minutes of setup. A fidgeting of moving around on scene and mm-hmm. then a train and then a gunfight and then credits. This and it's beautiful. This movie speaks to me as a gamer because that's exactly what especially in the type of games I play, like you're talking D D, uh second edition, three point five, you're talking riffs. There is so much subtly getting into position and there's <laughs> there's so much jockeying and there's so many roles that you're making. You're not just going, and I shoot that guy over there. He's a goon, right? He goes down. I mean, <laughs> oh, I've been is, in, we've all been in ghost this, games, though. This is where the GM's like, let my bad guy finish his speech. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> no, this is, this is, this is a D&D game to me. This is a, a heavy skill game to me. I would agree with that. And I, I was going to circle back around. Uh, you'd made comment about the, the, the long pans and the long 10 minute shots and the opening series. A lot of directors have kind of taken that in over the years. Most notably, Tarantino is now I was using say, it. Yeah, I have a if note you, for that as especially well. Especially if you watch uh, The Hateful Eight, mm. he uses a lot of the same camera setups and, and same type of dialogue and same zoom ins and zoom outs and fidgeting uh, as Leon does. And, and it's he he definitely left a mark on film, and I'm very happy for it. He didn't invent it. I imagine not. Who mm. is Akira Kurosawa, okay. <laughs> or no, m- many of the old samurai movies. This, this was is still my first exposure, though. This was essentially a samurai movie with guns. Yeah, because those shots, those close-ups, those stare downs, you were in the mental fight as opposed yeah, it, to just really yeah, yeah, physical. Yeah. You, because even with a with a, it's called Chanbara with a Chanbara style sword duel. You stare, you look, you posture. Maybe one of you is talking and insulting the other one. Maybe and the other one is simply standing there, <laughs> taking it in, twitching your eyebrows. But then finally, instead of the whole hand hovering above the the hand hovering above the holster, mm-hmm. it's a thumb clicks the the catch loose, yeah, and hovers above the blade, and then whoop, 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 dead. So, how would you rate this against uh, Indiana Jones? Where he's posturing and swinging his sword. <laughs> John just goes, bam. <laughs> <laughs> They're both wonderful. Oh, yeah, yeah. Well, that one has some story, which we'll touch I, yeah. on if we ever do. I, I actually yeah. think that's funny art. because that was the same kind of thing. He comes up. They meet each other's eyes. He goes into his elaborate sword thing. 
<laughs> just shoot some dead and walk away. That was that was what that huh? was what we call a lampshade or an inversion of the truth. <laughs> it was it was yeah. it was nice, and I'm just now realizing it. Yeah. Um, can we talk about uh, Ducote's list of crimes, Tuco? His list. Of oh crimes. my god! <laughs> what he's hanging? Did you write them down? No, I didn't. Okay. But I did like I did like one that I I think is uh is interesting for the old west. What was it? And it was one of his capital offenses. Deserting a wife and child. I remember that. Mm-hmm. Do you catch yeah. that? Yeah. That was a crime. What I do that find, is fantastic. What I find most interesting about that is that we're given his whole uh, list of crimes, one of which is deserting a wife and child, almost immediately after a scene in which the bad murders a man and his kid, leaving the wife and child behind. Yeah. Yeah. Can, was, can we go through the extensive list real quick? Do you, you got it? Do yes, it. I do. Under property crimes, armed robbery of citizens, state banks, and post offices, arson in a state prison, cattle rustling, counterfeiting and pressing counterfeit money, crimes against places of high authority, what including the burning down the courthouse and sheriff's office in Sonora, extortion, <laughs> highway robbery, horse thievery, illegal postal pickup, unlawfully drawing salary and living allowances from the Union Army, receiving stolen goods, robbery, robbing an unknown number of post offices. No, I think one of them, he, I think the way that they listed it in the movie was receiving stolen goods, selling stolen yeah. goods. <laughs> also under violent crimes, murder, kidnapping, ass- assaulting a justice of the peace, raping a virgin of the white race, which is, that's how it was said in the movie. That's not me, you know, saying anything. Oh, and when that line was spoken, that old woman was like, <gasps> yes. <Yeah. laughs> and then following, directly following that, statutory rape of a minor of the black race, uh, intention of selling fugitive slaves, and then bigamy, deserting his wife and children, hiring himself out as a guide on a wagon train. <laughs> After receiving his payment in advance, he deserted the wagon train in the hunting grounds of the Sioux Indians, inciting prostitution, misrepresenting himself as a Mexican general, perjury, and promoting prostitution. That's a hell of a laundry list. You know, with the racial and family abandoning crimes aside, I would be proud to have that on my tombstone. (laughs) I I would be proud to have that on my tombstone. I mean, yeah. (laughs) That is a life Mm -hmm. lived, baby. (laughs) And there was part of the script that it, it, interesting because it goes on wanted in 14 counties of the state. The condemned is found guilty of crimes of murder and armed robbery of citizens, state banks and post offices. The theft of sacred objects is what, you know, what he had said. So, yeah, it was With, good stuff. <laughs> he was a busy man. That, yeah, very busy. That whole business arrangement that they had worked out. It was great, though. It that was, really was. It was pretty cool. I, I got to tell you, a thousand dollars or even fifteen hundred. Even in today's money, that's a decent living. If you could get two hangings, you know, I mean, you could afford a small place. In 1860s. Yeah, I don't yeah. see the man with no name's fucking problem with that arrangement. That's that's good money. Each time. Well, how much did... Oh, that $1,000, right? Yeah. And when he went to buy that, that homebrew Remington Colt, yeah. and he asked how much, the guy said $20. I'm like, are you kidding, are you kidding me? me? Well, <laughs> the, the, in, the inflation calculator doesn't go back that far, but in... <laughs> In in 1913, that's the farthest back I can go with it. In 1913, $1,500 was uh, is, is equivalent to just shy of $40,000 Yeah, today. do you remember Old Yeller? Mm-hmm. Uh, yeah. I imagine oh, we all yeah. read that book oh, yeah. in, in school. Yeah, like dad went off and sold his his uh, his entire you know cow herd, and he came back with real paper folded money, dollars even. <laughs> <laughs> it's $1,000. Take it, asshole. Yeah. You're fine. <laughs> Can can we talk real quickly about uh, Eli Wallach and that whole scene? He, he played Tuco. Oh, okay. Uh, he's a he's a great actor. Um, he is classically trained. Yeah, character it, it is actor. one of those. I know yeah. a lot of people do have problems with with uh, kind of changing of ethnicity in movies because he is a very white uh, Jewish Jewish descent playing a a Hispanic outlaw. Was he? He did well. Oh yeah, he, he looked he, Hispanic to me. No, no, yeah, they did a very, very good job. But the whole scene with he's where he's playing with the gun. Eli Wall does does did not know anything about guns, so him <laughs> playing with those guns was all ad libbed. <laughs> Apparently, he did go to the gun master and say, "Hey, I want to do this," and he taught him how to take them apart and put them all together. Then, but he didn't know anything about how to look at and do anything. So the the that the was look another of, game moment of perplexity. Perplexity is that a, is that a word? Being perplexed. Let him by, know in the email. 
by the <laughs> by the, the the guy that was selling the guns that it's, was honest he was like i don't know what the fuck yeah. you're doing it's called bemusement yes yeah. thank you it struck me very much as uh as a low level character with like two <laughs> skill points in gunsmithing oh he's benny he's and, he's and benny he was, from from the mummy basically yeah well i, I it's just like it, he's he's second or third level he can only drop two ranks into something and he's like i'm going to take him and, well, apparently due to his crimes, he's going to take him in some not so savory things and <laughs> one in gunsmithing. And he just kind of, oh, a little bit of this, a little bit of that, a little bit of this. And the DM's just sitting there shaking his head. And yeah, and then I'll snap that barrel onto that one. Oh, fuck it. Just, just roll. roll. See 20. if it works. Okay. I guess you can mix five different guns together. <laughs> That's fine. He was an extremely talented character. He was, too. Yeah, he like, was. The movie Excellent opens shot. with him killing three dudes mm-hmm. in a room, leaping out of a window and getting away. And then he shows off his shooting skills. Yeah. He's a good writer. He's clearly good at communications. Like, he is... He's, he's the protagonist. <laughs> yeah. I, I'd go so far as to say he is the hero of the movie. The ugly is the hero. I would the agree whole with story that. is about him. He's the only yeah. one who has any character development. You meet his brother. You find out about his past. I mean, Clint Eastwood is nothing. He's just brooding. I yeah. brood. And I squint a lot. Here, I'm going <laughs> to share my cigarette. Yeah. <laughs> Pretty know? much all of the scenes with Clint Eastwood and or, all the scenes with Blondie and Angel Eyes were asides. Yeah. The main story followed Tuco. Yeah, I, yeah. I agree with that. Like and, the and only it's... part that um, that uh, Blondie had was when he was uh, helping the uh, the uh, Confederate soldier die. That was the only part where we saw any kind of character out of him at all. And it's funny that Clint Eastwood got top billing when Eli Wallach uh, had more scene time in, in 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 over the whole movie. He was in more of it than Clint Eastwood was. Was he established then? Yeah, he, he was. A, well, Clint Eastwood was on the rise, but he had top billing for the movie because he did the other two previous to this, and he'd done a couple other movies, and he was on, more on the rise. Do you remember rise. Rush Hour? Yeah. Chris Tucker and Jackie Chan. Yeah. That's why. You know? Uh, good I mean, point. So I don't know if you got this from your mining, but you remember what year this was released? Uh, in, 19, America. in America, it was 1966. Do you remember what year the other two were released? Uh, no, I do not. Off the, the top of my head. The same year. Really? In America. Yeah, you're right. The good, the bad, and the ugly. I'm sorry. In America, Fistful of Dollars was released in like January or something. You know a surprising amount about this? Yeah, January I'm to December. I'm a huge fan of Sir Gio. I was just saying, <laughs> I'm going to let him talk more about the mining than me because he seems to have more interest yeah. on this than, than I do. I they mean, were spaced over time in Italy. Yeah, January to December 1967. All three movies were released in America in the same year. There's some great lines in this movie, too. Mm-hmm. Oh, yeah. There's some- yeah, like when he's in the bath. When you have to shoot, shoot. Don't talk. <laughs> that was ad lib. That was an ad lib line. That's a most good line. of Eli Wallach's, uh, oh, most of e- most of Eli Wallach was all ad libbed, and he also almost died three times in this movie. Was one of them when he tried to get on the horse? Because um... there's this scene <laughs> where he's uh, he's still tied and they're riding away, mm-hmm. and yep, uh, that's Clint Eastwood one tries of them. to pull him up, and I see a hop and I see a stumble, and he like. Scruffs him by the back of the oh. coat, and his legs are going all side to side. That's not one of them. No, no, that's no. not one of them. Uh, when he's sitting, when, when he's about to be hanged, and he's sitting atop the horse, uh, the idea was that the horse would be ushered away, leaving leaving him to hang. And Eastwood was supposed to fire the the rifle, you know, to shoot the rope. Mm-hmm. A small explosive charge in the rope would then detonate, allowing him to to be free. But what Leon didn't count on was the fact that the horse was going to be spooked by the sound of the rifle and took off at a dead gallop <laughs> with Eli Wallach on his back, his hands still tied, kind of getting choked. Yeah. Uh, there was also the scene in which Tuco escapes Union captivity he, by cutting his handcuffs mm-hmm. under the moving train. Leon wanted to make sure the audience saw Wallach himself and not the stuntman. Um, so, that, that scene dragged under there was impressive. Yeah. So Wallach Especially agreed, for the time. And then realized after the first take that a metal step affixed to one of the cars had missed his head by inches. Mm-hmm. He said in his autobiography <laughs> later that I realized, quote, I realized that if I'd raised my head four or five inches, I'd be decapitated. Do you remember the third one? Yes. Uh, during it's the film's climax, one. when Turco unearthed the gold hidden in the cemetery, the crew applied acid to one of the bags of gold so that when Wallach would yeah. hit it, it would... Bo- 
What they didn't tell him was that they had put the acid in the lemon soda drink that he had been drinking because they thought it was an empty can, and he took a drink of it and noticed immediately <laughs> that something was a little amiss <laughs> and spat out the acid. That's probably for the best. Yes. There's a lot of scenes in this movie that take it from a Western and into an epic. There's a lot of very humanizing scenes. Oh, this is straight up an epic. Um, yeah. the, the torture scene with the soldiers playing. Uh-huh. That's some straight fiddler on fiddler on the roof level sad moment shit. I mean, there's the, the violin player who will not play and he's told to play again. And I mean, it's just there, there are some some very very human moments. The uh, the drunk union officer, uh, the commander at the end. I mean, they're they're just moments where you go, eh, spaghetti western. Oh, that's adorable. Oh, look, he killed him in the back. Oh, damn, man. The when okay, and this was one of the ones that I understood was added in the extended edition when Angel Eyes visits that Confederate camp that's been shelled into oblivion and it's just a handful of people there. Yeah. And then just that one dude just exchanges all of this information for the sheer pleasantness, the luxury of booze. Yeah. Like and he looks at it like, oh God, I haven't yeah. Or yeah, the when 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 he puts the 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 coat and lets the yeah, dying guy yeah. have the cigar, or when the captain of the union is dying and Clint keep Eastwood's your ears like, open. Clint Eastwood's like, let me pour this in your throat. Yeah. <laughs> well, you both of you made the comment about you know there are moments of it being very you know humanizing, and Leon had wanted to like build and show this absurdity of war, which I think he captured really well. Uh, around the time of the of the Civil War, because well, Leon is definitely the DM. Oh, yeah, because he's trying to show this beautiful this beautiful. Set, I agree. And the PCs just run in and wreck his beautiful bridge <laughs> <laughs> with this cockamamie <laughs> bullshit story. I could literally see the DM Sergio Leone. He's like, I, I, I want to like. show the horrors of war. How can I give this to the players? <laughs> okay, here we go. And it's going to be beautiful. And it's going to be a build up, and they're like, "We're here to join." <laughs> <laughs> oh, don't worry. That bridge is. Tr- we'll get. We'll get rid of that for you. Oh well, no. I think the DM. I can picture Sergio Leone sitting behind the DM screen, both cackling and also like shaking, face yeah. palming when they do this. But he got revenge on his players and he's like oh no we're gonna we're gonna run across the desert now and now i'm going to describe it for 30 minutes <laughs> what the desert looks like it's like oh okay now you're gonna look for the grave keep Burn. looking <laughs> keep spinning keep looking <laughs> keep looking <laughs> nope i still have 10 minutes keep yeah. looking <laughs> yeah <laughs> run around in a panic <laughs> um i wasn't expecting to like this movie as much really? as i did i uh it's not my forte. I don't. I mean, my 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 forays into westerns before this were Blazing Saddles, <laughs> Shane, Shane, <laughs> True Grit, um, probably. Nope. No. Um. I know. I'm, I'm listing them right now. Oh. Uh, Deadwood, which I think is an amazing show. Deadwood is solid. Yes. And uh, what was the one with uh, Val Kilmer's Tombstone? Tombstone. Okay. And th- that's it. That's the extent of Matthews westerns. You didn't say wider. No. Okay. No, and this this was amazing. I mean, I'm going to watch more Sergio, 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 I Sergio, 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 Sergio. That they're they're fucking fantastic. Yeah. Well, this is again the spaghetti western. Yeah. yeah. Like, it's called spaghetti western. Yeah, it is. It is the third film by him uh, with Clint Eastwood to make that cinematic trilogy. See, I don't like current Clint Eastwood because his politics are shit. Yeah. But I thought he was perfect in the movie. So this the title for this movie, The Good, the Bad, and the Ugly, was originally uh, supposed to have the word dollars in it, uh, in the title capitalized on the previous films, A Fistful of Dollars and For a Few Dollars More. Dollars for Ugly. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> uh, but un- unfortunately, conflicts between Eastwood and Leon came to a head during the dubbing sessions for this movie. They never worked again, even though Leon tried to get Clint Eastwood to work on Once Upon a Time in the West and then Once Upon a Time in America. Interestingly enough, the ADR on this was off. The dubbing? Oh, it was very... Well, there's a... Re- Which also made it feel like a samurai film. <laughs> there's, there's a reason for that because the, the, the actors that were Italian and the actors that were Spanish were told, go ahead and speak in your native tongue. Uh, and then the Americans had their, you know, right. English. So they had to go back and, and redub everything. It was just was easier. Was this done in America? 
No, it was filmed in Spain. Really? I did. Yeah. Most also, of it was filmed in Spain. At that time, that was just how it happened. There right. is that, yeah. A lot of, like, even the actor Clint Eastwood and the main three characters spoke English, but they still overdubbed their own lines onto the, because they just didn't have the best technology no. for yeah. picking up dialogue. Apparently, yeah. the, the studios in Italy and Spain were horrible. So that's why they read. They yeah. one, of the, one of the reasons why they read Dublin. The the filming actually began, and I'm horrible with names, names we know. as we say. Uh, Cinecita. You studio, said it wrong. In, in, probably in Rome. In you said Rome wrong. I'm sorry. I fucking hate you. I'm gonna stab you. <laughs> it's Rome. <laughs> no, go ahead, Dustin. I'm sorry. Uh, and then uh, the production then moved to Spain's plateau region near uh, Burgos. Bur- Burgos. Uh, in the north, which doubled for the southwestern United States. Just I don't want you. He just threatened my life. <laughs> <laughs> I want to correct him. <laughs> and then again, they shot the western scenes and in Almeria in the south of Spain later on. One of the things that I did like with the overdubbing is that they brought Clint Eastwood and uh, what's his name? Eli back in their early 2000s mm-hmm. when they remastered and added those scenes back. Yeah. I think there were 13 scenes that were added back into yeah. the movie, and some of them shorter, some of them very long. They couldn't get what's his name. Uh, no, he was he had already passed he had already away. Died. Yeah. yeah, that was one thing that because this is one of the older movies that we've watched, and I'm looking at it, and like there's the dog in the graveyard, and there's all the horses, and there's you know yeah, every, all those every, animals are dead. Every old person, <laughs> everyone who is over like 30 in that movie is dead. Oh, the or, kid at the, the beginning is probably dead too. Yeah. yeah, like everyone is, everyone we're seeing there. That that's all that's left of them. <laughs> They're all dead. Yeah. Did you know that the cemetery, this oh the whole the cemetery scene, that wide cemetery, that was an extremely detailed set that had been made I for the movie. All the sets were extremely detailed. Oh yeah, but that was miniature. Like, like it, was, it was very. Small I was set. expecting Star Trek foam hmm. and painted rock, but I mean they made this elaborate. Um, this elaborate series of revetments and dugouts for the war scene, uh, that bridge itself, uh, that was, I, that, that was a real bridge. That was real work. There was real people pouring across it. It, I, I was very impressed by what they did set wise. Matthew, I'm so happy. What? That now you get to experience the rest of Sergio. Oh yeah. I'm, I'm oh, yeah. To it. <laughs> Cause this is what he does. It was, it was <laughs> honestly for what was this? That's the sixties, right? Mm-hmm. Yeah. I yes. was incredibly impressed by this. I was not quite as impressed as I was by 2001, but I mean, it's the same level of how the fuck did they pull that off with what they had then? Like that shot under the train. Do you remember the size of film cameras then? Oh yeah. How, how did and they get that? Funny <laughs> thing about, that you should mention about the fucking <laughs> camera work. Uh, go ahead. Keep, keep talking about what you're talking about. I'm well, sorry. There's, there's, there's that shot. Um, there's a couple high lows. Um, they they made such use of prime. And one of the things I noticed about uh, the 4K is that you could honestly tell because you couldn't tell during their playback. Their, when, when the person at the time was filming it, they were trying for these super tight things. So like face, there was a lot of face time. Mm-hmm. But when you look at it now with uh, like 4K technology, you realize that the actual focus is just a, an inch and a half back on his collar. And I mean, they, they, they worked. They did amazing things with low tolerance technology that made an incredible taut high tolerance production that I just found incredible for what they were using at the time. They couldn't monitor. They couldn't play back. No, they had they, to get they, the dailies back every yeah, day. I mean, this, this was an incredible piece of craftsmanship given the tools that they had to use at the time. So the film was shot using technoscope. Do you, have you I, I, yeah. I know a lot of movies have said like filmed in technoscope. Now what that is, if you don't know, is that you can shoot without an anamorphic lens and use only half as much as film as you normally would. So they didn't have that huge fucking canister of film sitting underneath with, with the, with the train yeah. scene that you were talking about. Uh, that, that the technoscope process places two widescreen frames on a single 35 millimeter f- uh, frame. So it's also called two perf. A 35 millimeter frame has four perforations. So it uses half the amount of film that would be normally used. So it does make, it, you can use a smaller canister, basically. Yeah. It's really cool. The cinematography that was done for this, 
That was Tonio Deli Colli. Tell me this person won, won some award. It doesn't have to be one of the big ones. But I actually they, didn't they, mind, they but, but there are celebrated. some movies that, that you will know. Uh, he did the, the, the Once Upon a Time in the West that we've talked about, okay. Once Upon a Time in America, Death and the Maiden. He shot for that. And then he also shot The Name of the Rose. Uh-oh. Oh, no shit. So, yeah. Nice. Uh, that's funny so enough we were talking about that, talking you know, about about that. before well, that's before a movie recording. that's going to be on our list very soon yeah. so yeah. you're, you're going to see a lot of similarities okay between... because i like i was, was just saying i was i was when i thought about what they were working with and then i saw what they managed to pull off i was i was blown just, away yeah blown away it, was, it is and it was outside it wasn't in studio which is way different 2001 in studio models mm-hmm. lots of time Lots you're, of small not, models, you're not, you're not, very you're not working against the sunset. You know, I, I, this was an amazing movie. And you and I both being big into photography, you do have to take into account time of day, yeah. uh, the sun, where it's the location, the shadows when you're filming. It can be a pain in the ass. Yeah. Also, I really want um, a revolver rifle now. I've decided. <laughs> I, yeah. I didn't know what I was going to get for my next gun, but I want an old revolver rifle now. I shot my first gun this past weekend. You were telling me yeah, about that. That sound, that's awesome. Never shot a gun before in my life. And after shooting a variety of weapons, I have lamented that I have wasted so much time <laughs> not shooting before. It was uh, fun. I uh, started with some 22 revolvers. Okay. Worked our way up to higher caliber caliber revolvers Mm -hmm. and then started with 22 automatics worked away up through higher caliber automatics uh one of the things of course means semi-automatic because automatics are illegal in the state one of the things that we did shoot was a judge it was a really fun gun to shoot Mm -hmm. uh basically a very fucking huge revolver that shoots shotgun shells Mm -hmm. it was wonderful i love those and it has significantly less kick than you would think it would. Because I think those are 410 shells, aren't yeah. they? Yeah, they're, they're, they're little baby yeah. shells. It, it was six, if you know, it was at least six shots. Mm-hmm. But uh, And then we moved into rifles. I did That's where rifles. things start getting fun. Yes. What you started messing with scopes. I don't remember the names of the guns, but I did shoot six. an AR uh, well, I forget and, what and he some called sort it, of but it was AR frame. In, yeah. yeah. I, I did, we worked our way up for the rifles, so the 22 into... Uh, something that we called smurfette which was <laughs> an ar whatever i forget it was a, a very high caliber rifle mm-hmm. that was rainbow embossed <laughs> right down to the fucking barrel it was gorgeous Orange. had uh so I, I again i'm not a gun person but we shot it with several attachments we shot it base without any attachments yep. shot one with one that matt called the loudener because it, it, it laid it much louder <laughs> and another one called uh, another one that was a suppressor and it was an amazing experience i remember at one point there's a pictures of me that i will post online but i'm shooting this gun and i'm shooting and I'm, i was unsure because i'd never shot i'd never shot but then again i'd also never shot anything that powerful so i shoot it and i was like yeah good shot shoot it again he's like now, why are you not shooting that faster? I, like, yeah. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> there is something in in our monkey self that realizes that our claws are shit and our fangs are shit. And it silences a little monkey fear inside of us that we have something that can kill the, the non-existent lions, tigers, and bears. Oh, my. Guns are fun. Guns are a they, lot they, of fun. They it are. was a lot of fun. And he was he was a good teacher. Uh, this was Matt. Matt was one yeah. of the co-directors of Wagon Con. And uh, he was gracious enough to take some of us out there and do some shooting. It was good. I, I haven't gone shooting in quite a while. The last time was with my with my buddy Andy and then another friend, Bruce. And we went down to the range. And like their comments afterwards was, were... I want to be with Dusty when the end of the world and the zombies come because he can shoot a <laughs> rifle very, very far. So like, one at one point, I was like, okay, so I had this revolver, and I was like, so I'm going to hold it at my hip. And he's oh, like, no. do not do that. Yeah. Like, <laughs> okay. Yeah, it's really easy to shoot yourself that way. Did anybody ever actually shoot like this in the Old West? Or was it yeah, just the losers. legend? Was it just the legend? Like um, Trick shots. Uh, yeah. That was a form of pastime was uh trick shooters and skill shooters you know, annie oakley and things like that yeah um there were people who could shoot like that there were not many 
and they weren't everyone. Few Not everyone carried between. their carried their gun at belly level, pointed out like a storm, like a fucking stormtrooper. Most people brought it up to their eye level, just like we do now. Okay, um, but there were people who could do that. Okay, yeah. yeah. I was just always like, I'll, I'll let the heroes yeah. do it in a movie, but I'll call out the henchmen because if they could do that, <laughs> they would have been the fucking heroes. They would have been the fucking hero, and that's why the henchmen all died really yeah. quickly. Yeah, yeah, I agree. Uh, Eastwood was actually very reluctant to make this third picture. United Artists wanted that script wasn't even ready. And they're like, do it. We're going to do a third one. Get it going now. And uh, Eastwood said, uh, I don't want to do this until he drafted a deal that gave him $250,000 up front plus 10%. Did he get it in coin? (laughs) Plus 10% of the North American profits. And then he ordered a Ferrari like from Italy, from Leon, got him a Ferrari. Profit and, and a Ferrari. Ferrari. <laughs> I don't. I, I don't like Clint Eastwood, but he was he was good. In this. Yeah, I don't he care. Was. You know, uh, Charles Bronson was originally offered the both the roles. I'm of glad Tuco it wasn't him and Angel oh, well, Eyes. Maybe maybe for Tuco. Mm, I don't know, but I think the guy who had it did better. I agree. Eli oh, Wallach. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Eli Wallach did a fantastic job as Tuco. Yeah, Angel Eyes. Bronson was is Van just Cleese? he's he's too yeah. meaty. Oh, Bronson is the main character in Once Upon a Time in the yeah. West. Yeah, but he he's, basically he's, takes over the Clint Eastwood. He's character. he's too meaty in the face. I and too squinty. A lot more yeah. squinty, like like almost Steven Seagal baby. He squinty. was not meaty in the face at that time. No, he All did right, a couple fair. really yeah. good war movies that that. Uh, but once he becomes like the mechanic and all <laughs> oh that my, stuff, this uh, is completely yeah. on a tangent, and okay. I will completely understand if you cut this. <laughs> I was at the Cove. It was a slow night, Monday night, and we were flipping through things to watch. Did you know that there is a movie with Mike Tyson and Steven Seagal? Yes. I forget the name of it, though. It is. It came out like a year ago, and it is awful, but good, but awful. No, there's no good in this. No, the fight scenes are fantastic. Now, I watched it without sound, so I couldn't hear Mike Tyson's lines. (laughs) (laughs) But I really want. To, and now we can go back to our regularly scheduled programming. But I just needed to let you know that that is a thing, and it existed. So in 1966 uh, and 67, uh, movies did not get a budget like this one had. Uh, this had a budget of a very high, at the time, $1.2 million. Yeah. Uh, and you can kind of that see was, it. You can see A lot it. of that was put into... Set design, yeah, I imagine. And, and the camera, and yeah, there's a like lot. Like they carved out a cliff and built a real bridge, and... USA, uh, uh, gross USA made six point one million, so that's not too bad. But cumulative worldwide gross, uh, twenty five million back on that movie at the time yeah. frame. So that was that was pretty good. And that's in sixties dollars. Yeah. That meant something. I understand that it it did not really succeed in the U.S. until later. When I was just thinking, what a yeah. million is now? That's two houses in Gresham. Yeah, oh, no. Jesus. <laughs> just, because of the staggered release and because of the fact that America was kind of over Westerns yeah. at the time. Yeah. But Leone in that year revitalized them, just revived them in his own spaghetti version. And and that goes back to in the beginning saying that it was it was it was this was satire on the American Western. Not only that, like every every hybrid is usually better. Yeah, John Wayne was on his way out. He was now doing Genghis Khan and yeah. not like just you know the, his traditional westerns. He was he was pretty much done. Uh, but yeah, he he Sergei Leone did bring back the western. He made it a a thing again. I I, I do like the thought that this is a, a mongrel film. It takes two very different styles and makes something better than either one. By combining the two. Eastwood it, it, hated it, though. Who, who fuck cares what Eastwood likes? <laughs> I think what it does... Shut up and squint and mumble at me, I Eastwood. would not say better, but it creates a new targeted focus. It creates a new thing that a whole new group of people suddenly realize that this is something All right, we that, love. That's fair. Mm-hmm. But I, I I think that's that's important that it was, it was not either. It was a combination of both that made yeah. something new. All right. Well, that's all I had on it. I honestly, for a three hour movie, I only had one page because a lot of it was just glancing. There, there was, there was supposed to be it, even though this was a prequel to a trilogy, there was supposed to be a sequel to this one. 
uh, that uh, it was stated on numerous occasions that uh, the the screenwriter had written a treatment for a sequel tentative, tentatively titled The Good, The Bad, and The Ugly 2. Okay, very what, was, uh, what was the plot of that? Uh, according to him, Eli Wallach uh, would have returned, uh, would have been set 20 years after the original mm-hmm. and would have followed Tuco pursuing Blondie's grandson for the gold. Uh, Clint Eastwood expressed interest in taking the part of the film's production, including acting as a narrator, uh, but it, it ultimately... Uh, was v- uh, vetoed by Leon, and he did not want the original film's uh, title or characters to be used, nor did he want to be involved in another Western film. Fantastic. Well, that yeah. was your plot hook for uh, how to game this at your table. <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> really? Oh, God, I'm sorry. <laughs> well, that's a very good segue. <laughs> no, I was curious. I was like, I have something written, but I wonder what they did. <laughs> All right, Although, I, we, uh, I, I have one one more thing to it. note though because I, I like numbers on some of these things. So the gold that uh, that they were that they were seeking. So the price of gold in 1862 was twenty dollars an ounce. Uh. <laughs> on, oh. Buy gold, people. <laughs> on, buy gold. In, 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 to, in August of 2011, an ounce of gold reached an all time high of U.S. Uh, just shy of two thousand dollars. So an ounce. So the two hundred thousand dollars of gold at Tuco Angel and Angel Eyes and Blondie would have been worth over eighteen point five million dollars. Yeah, I'd kill men for that. I'd yeah. kill a man for that. Too. I'd kill men for significantly less. So tell you what. In fact, if anyone's offering, please send an email to Matthew. <laughs> have <of> so <laughs> Let's take a break and talk about all the ways that we can mechanically kill someone for eighteen million dollars and, and not go into a hook. Apparently, of Confederate gold. <laughs> Confederate gold only. Hi, everyone. This is your favorite host, Matthew. This week's episode is brought to you by Guardian Games, who we are proud to have as our sponsor. Guardian Games is Portland's largest gaming store. They have almost every game you can think of, be it role-playing, board game, card games, miniature games, even video games. They also have a ton of gaming-related material and some pretty neat swag. I mean, the D20 fuzzy dice that go in your mirror, that's good stuff. If uh, (laughs) if you're 21... Uh, You can have a drink in the back at the Critical Sip. Booze makes gaming better. Always has, always will. There's free games back there. You'll love it. Uh, They also have a friendly and incredibly knowledgeable staff, and they are the hub of a diverse and friendly gaming community. Um, If you're in Portland, you definitely want to go to Guardian Games. Hey, now let's bring this to the gaming table. Dusty, tell us about these characters. All right. We have, uh, starting off, we have Clint Eastwood as Blondie, also known as the man with no name. Also known as the good. Yes. Which I is the good. don't know that that really fits. No. Uh, <laughs> a subdued, confident bounty hunter who teams up with Tuco and Angel Eyes temporarily to find the buried gold. Also, and if you a, don't know who Clint Eastwood is. <laughs> he he the plays fuck? the same character. I was just going to say, movie. if you don't know who Clint Eastwood is. I envy you. <laughs> <laughs> I don't. Clint Eastwood is whatever you say about his politics, which I don't actually know anything about his politics. I will say that Clint Eastwood's been. Don't, you know, if you like him a, now, don't investigate he it. He is a character yeah. badass. You D- know, yeah. character Dirty badass. Harry, yeah. the man with. No I wonder name. if if Clint Eastwood is what Kevin Costner wanted to be. I think so. Do, do you think? Because I I saw this squinty blonde dude, and we went. And I was almost, like, <laughs> and we had just done Robin Hood, and I was like, well. I could see that he looked in the in the mirror and he's like, I am Clint Eastwood. I am Clint Eastwood. And he failed miserably. But I, I could see that he would be trying to go for that. We we went almost an entire episode without yeah, bringing up his name. <laughs> so, so alignment, chaotic, neutral. Agreed. Yeah. That's what I've written. He's, exactly. I, they call him the good, but he is not. Yeah. I, I think the only reason he'd be good because he, you know, he didn't. You know, in the beginning, he was he didn't kill. He didn't murder two, a family. Yeah. yeah, he just wasn't out murdering people. Like, it, you know. If this were palladium, I would say unprincipled. Yeah, agreed. Yeah. Um. Yeah, there's there's only three here. Yeah. So let's and then just, we have scroll through them Lee, Lee Van Cleef as Angel Eyes, the bad, a ruthless, unfeeling, and sociopathic mercenary who always finishes a job he has paid for, which Lawful is usually evil finding and killing people. Lawful evil. Yeah. Agreed. Yeah. If this were palladium, aberrant. Yeah. 
Yeah. Although the actor, the scene where he has to slap the prostitute, mm-hmm. the actor was like so against that they had to bring in a a, a double because he refused, and they like threatened to cut his pay. And he's like, "Go ahead, yeah, I don't, I'm, I'm not going to be the woman hit for a woman." And, right uh, on, yeah, 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 right on. Uh, Good and for then, him and because then, she is one of only two women I think in the whole movie. Well, two women who speak. No, only one woman I think who speaks is her. Yeah, and that's just such a terrible role. To, to to have to be yeah. like you know i am the woman who gets slapped in the movie come on and then Hollywood. we have the great Sergio. eli wallach uh who is tuco benedicto pacifico juan maria ramirez i really like his name the rat uh according to blondie uh, of course and uh, he is the ugly a comical comical and oafish but cagey and resilient fast talking Mexican bandit who was wanted by the authorities for a long list of crimes. Chaotic neutral. neutral. Yeah. yeah, agreed if also. If you're anarchist. Yeah. I, there there yeah. wasn't a good character in this. No, there was no, 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 no good alignment. I mean, good could also be from your own personal perspective. Oh, no, we've tried that. You guys keep shooting it down. But... <laughs> no, I, I. they call this the good, the bad, and the ugly, but he was not good in any way. No. Have, have, have yeah. you seen the Korean take on this movie? The good, the bad, and the weird. Yeah. It's okay. Yeah. It's weird. All right. <laughs> all right. I thought it was decent, so. I'm glad we're all in uh, agreement there. Yeah. Because, I mean, they were all shitbirds. <laughs> yes. Yeah. But, Kate, yeah. With, along, One of but, them had personality. But along with the themes of the movie, you can you can kind of see why all of them were shitbags. I mean, it was the Civil well, War. Well, you, you could see why one, there was no character development to the rest. True. So. Okay. Good point. Yeah. I this mean, is very true. Like the, in fact, I would say the character with the least development is Clint Eastwood. Yeah. Because very simply... He has no at name. Least with, at least with Angel Eyes, we know a little bit of his background, and he does talk about his ethics. Yeah. Whereas with Clint Eastwood, it's just, I've gave I'm, a cigar to a dying man. Yeah, I mean, and not yeah. only that, but he's just like, well, I'm done with this partnership. Best of luck. <laughs> and not just yeah. best of luck, but best of luck and fuck you. Yeah, I mean, he, he, was, he straight up betrayed his partner. Uh, Eastwood did say that it, it's funny about the lack of characterization. That was what Clint Eastwood said after seeing a final cut of the movie, saying that the movie itself is over bloated at the three hour mark and that his character had no characterization. And and part of me agrees. Uh, no, I agree. I agree. But a part of me as a writer is like, well, if you're if you're taking what someone has written, it's up to you to add characterization to it, I think. I mean, you, you're acting this out. You're supposed to build on what you have so it's like hey this is your fault for it not having a lot of characterization yeah but i'm clint eastwood i don't care care. (laughs) okay all right (laughs) that was everyone everyone else was an npc yeah yeah everyone else yeah yeah that's all i got for characters yeah all right well matthew where do we go after this um where does well, despite what us? I said earlier, um, <laughs> I'm going to guess, I'm going to make a couple educated guesses based on what we know of the characters as to what's going to happen next. First of all, uh, Tuco is just going to blow that money. I, he is going to blow that money. Do you think he's even going to make it out of there with the money? No. Yes. He is going to. No, he is. He is going to make it to the nearest town that has a brothel, a bar, and a place to spend money on shiny things. All right. Well, first off, he's south of the border, and he has four large he's bags not south of the border. Uh, they're in Mexico. Didn't they make no. it to Mexico? I thought they crossed the Rio Grande. That wasn't the Rio Grande. No, that was a, no, a I river. Mean, I, I thought that they there was a whole dialogue them about them crossing the Rio Grande. Did they not cross the Rio Grande? No, no I didn't okay. take it as. I mean, they talked about it, but I take it that they yeah. must have been really damn close to the Rio Grande. Yeah. No, they were still in America. Okay. All right. So anyway, he's he's down there, close to the. Did, had we conquered that area? Was okay. I, I'm rough on my history here, but when did we take uh, apparently, Texas? Apparently, this was right on the other side of the bridge. Yeah. Because I mean, bridge. They were there at the graveyard. Like he made it, it on was the foot. Confederate graveyard. Right? Yeah. Yeah. So he made um, it there. He made it to the graveyard. It was like right got, over that hill. He's got four bags of gold, one of which is torn mm-hmm. that he tore himself because he's an asshole. Because uh, he's an idiot. I, I, I think he can get it to somewhere because he has that whole battlefield to pick stuff from. Uh-huh. So uh, somewhere in there, he's going to find a cart and a horse. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, there's there's lots of stuff. Um, He can. And 
if he if he's smart about it, he can even loot that that graveyard. He can loot a lot of things. In in answer to your question, we had we had claimed Texas as part of the United States in 1845. So this is okay. The movie is set roughly uh, 40 years after. All right. Um. Anyway, so this assumes Tuco has enough native knowledge skills to pick up a gun, and we know that once he has a gun, he is skilled enough to defend himself. Two points in the in in gun. <laughs> <laughs> well, he's got a lot of points in shooting that yeah. thing at least. Um. And all the okay. weapons he could ever want are right over there. All right, so he makes it so out he's with got money. Um, we can furthermore assume that the stoic man with no name is probably not going to do anything with the money. He just wants the money. A classic trope in this thing would be he gets himself a place and is now a farmer. The the, the former warrior mm-hmm. fighter. Wanting to live a quiet wants life. To live simple yeah. And never, you know, it, it breeds horses or some shit like that. Doesn't have to think about. Yeah. The, the, we, we never quite get an insight into war. why he wants money. Yeah. Like, who we knows? Can, we can kind of pick it up when we look at Angel Eyes because he's a man who dresses well. Yeah. Uh, talks well, likes fine things. He clearly likes to spend the money that he has paid. But Clint Eastwood's. His, his character does not have. Any personality. No, nothing going back to that thing yeah. and why he does what he does. So yeah. that's what I think is going to happen next with the people from the movie. I don't see them being played. Uh, those those become NPCs in control of the DM, GM, whatever you want. Story tell. Okay. The PCs will play a desperate band of, of desperados or banditos um, who managed to waylay a completely broke Tuco after being driven out of town for unpaid gambling debts. Tuco has five thousand dollars in his boot, and that is the remnants of his fortune. Wow, spent that real fast. Yeah, five thousand dollars is a lot of fucking money. Still, mm-hmm. the the PCs will waylay him. He is pissed drunk. He is an easy target for them. He will attempt to fast talk and bargain for his life by telling them about this vast fortune left unspent of a hundred thousand dollars of a man known as <gasps> Blondie. The PCs. Now have uh, their adventure hook to go find Blondie. Okay, to uh, pick up this part of the hundred thousand dollars. Now Tuco will go with them as the DM's control and basically the MacGuffin generator to to keep them <laughs> steered on the right track and keep things moving forward. If the PCs will allow it. Now we've uh, already seen in the movie how Tuco treats his hirelings. Yeah, <laughs> uh, the PCs are disposable. And Tuco will not share the rest of that money. Tuco will seek to betray the PCs at any given moment when they're located. When, when he's got him located. Okay. So, like, they will, the PCs will set up for this battle. You know, whoever's the sharpshooter will be up on the hill looking down at the farmstead. The other three will go forward with Tuco. Tuco will take this opportunity to run around and try and figure out where the money is and loot. And if see the that. PCs that would be good. emerge victorious, Tuco will attempt to turn on them to, you know, break down what he's got to share. And uh, as evidence from the movie, Tuco is a really fine shot. Yeah. And he's also really good at portraying himself as a worthless piece of crap. So the PCs have probably already built up this... The players, not just the PCs, but the players of <laughs> yeah. this game are probably already convinced that this guy is a worthless piece of shit, and they're they're already planning on betraying him. But then the GM's oh, got this absolutely. character sheet, and he's like, oh, trust me. <laughs> I got you covered, fam. <laughs> yeah. Um, uh, Tuco will not move until he sees a clear path to the money. He knows that the man with no name is more skilled than he is. Tuco is very skilled, but the man with no name is a better shot. I don't know about that because Tuco's shot was never compared against his. In the movie, all of those times, Tuco was scared of the man with no name, and, and, that, and name that brings him down. Yeah, him. yeah, he kept outsmarting him. But one Tuco, way or another, he's not going to betray the party until he sees a clear path to that money. I can see that. Once that path, like if they if they lead him away. They, they, they don't even have to fight him. If they get him away from the money momentarily, Tuco will betray them instantly. But he will not betray them. He'll be fairly loyal until that path opens to him. I think there should be a side quest. Always. An yeah. optional side quest involving Tuco's brother. With the priest? The yes. abbot? They should have an option where they possibly learn of Tuco and his past from the abbot. Oh, that's good. Yeah. You got to work that in somehow. Be good stuff. Yeah. yeah. 
I'd like that. But it has to be one of those where that kind of information is not gained easily. Like, it might not be an obvious choice. Oh, they might be given like an Oregon Trail style thing. Do we go to the left or do we go to the right? <laughs> right. Do we go to the town or do we go to the abbot to rest up? And they're like, oh, we're kind of avoiding. We don't want to bring attention to ourselves going to men of God. So well, we're not going to go to the abbot. But if they're like, no, we should go rest up or something. or we'll, we'll you, wait. you can we'll, random encounter yeah. it and then you need to heal. So where do you go? You go find a priest, right? Oh, and it just so <laughs> happens to be his brother. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And then they get some information. And perhaps they could even convince Tuco. To not be a total bastard to them. That would be good. Maybe. I, might, I, li- I like Tuco oh as the total bastard myself. <laughs> you could work in a redemption arc there. You could. Yeah. I, I want to play this game. I yeah. really do. <laughs> Tuco is very likable. Um, he's a bit of a weasel, but you sense underneath a bunch of bad drunken decisions, lawlessness. <sighs> Well, rape and other things. Maybe, maybe not such a good character. But there, there, are, there are elements in him that are the remnants of a decent person. Do you think it's just one of those, like, just given a bad uh, suit of cards, like, in life, just well, bad hands? I, especially in today's climate, I, I hesitate to say something like that. But I, think I, he... I, I will say that there are, there are parts of him that are redeemable. I can, I can agree with that. I think he had some bad dealings, but he also made that worse with some equally, if not worse, choices. Yeah. Okay. I also like, I forgot to bring this up in the last segment, when they're being shelled and he's hiding ass up. (laughs) 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 He's just asleep with his ass in the air. Or with the captain, the captain's like, what are their names? And they look at each other and he just goes, <laughs> okay, <laughs> it's fine. Yeah. There are so many good little just one shot moments. Yeah. And most movie. of most of them were ad libbed by him. Yeah. yeah. Um. Anyway, that's my hook. I think it would be, I think it would be a decent game to play. I have an idea of what you can play it with, but I'll leave that to you. I've got a large number of options here. Let's first look at the themes of the game. Things that we want to make sure that we have in a system uh, th- themes that we want to bring from this movie to our gaming table and, and incorporate in whatever campaign that we run. Betrayal. Betrayal. Betrayal has to be there. In fact, not just from the people that are paying you. We want a game that encourages the players, the party, the characters at the table to not fully trust each other. That needs to be something that we can all buy into. Yeah. Not a lot of games allow that. Many of them are you know, be kind of built on the whole, you know, seamless party. Like D and D, fucking just breaks down. Yeah. If there's even one member of the group who's betraying the others, that's how so many. Everybody, everybody has a story of that one guy that might have actually <laughs> been you. Yeah, playing the thief <laughs> that screwed over the party. Uh, and- there, there is a system that does have betrayal, and it's the one I was going to bring, but I'll, I'll talk about that later. We also. Because a lot of the old Western movies frequently had things about like homesteads and farming and cattle herding and all kind of unexciting things like that. We don't really need that. I agree. What we care about, we care about guns. Gold. Gold. Betrayal. <laughs> um, and that's about it. Survival. And, and tri- yeah. trick shooting. Trick shooting. And a game where somebody can get far in life with the bullshit skill. Yeah. There's a number of options for this. Uh, Again, I'm going to go ahead and throw it out there. Savage Worlds (laughs) can do this game. (laughs) However, Savage Savage Worlds is a bit more pulpy than than this movie. That said, Savage Worlds has a Western setting called Deadlands. Deadlands is a little spookier, and it's got some magic and whatnot. But if you strip that out, you've got a game that is a solid fighting system that uh, actually has a built-in gunfighting duel system as well. Which I like. I like the Deadlands system. But there is a big man on the playing field. And Matthew knows that game. Oh, yes. Tell us about it. Aces and eights. Yeah. By the people who brought you your beloved Hackmaster. Hackmaster is a wonderful game. I don't feel necessarily the same about Aces and Eights, but I'll let you talk about it. I want to bring, I brought Aces and Eights to this for a couple of reasons. One, this is a Monty Hall movie. The amount of money is completely ridiculous for the time. I I can see that. Okay. Yeah. Um, I can completely agree with that. Also, 
the levels of betrayal. Hackmaster, while you're in a party, and, and aces and eights to the same degree, there are so many paths of betrayal. Um, th- there are so many different ways that you can abuse trust. And everyone sitting at an aces and eights table or a hackmaster table isn't just looking at their character sheet in the GM. They're watching the people around them. They're watching where the notes are passed. They're watching what alliances are being made. Who's fucking whom? And that is one of the main reasons why I think Aces and Eights is a great game for this. But I have another. This movie specifically has a lot of time spent on minutia, on tiny details. Now, Aces and Eights delves deep into tiny details. It's not a Savage Worlds game. Uh, it's not a game where there are faceless minions to be disposed of. It is a game where on your round, your hand, you're, you're going to go out and make the concealment roll and your hand creeps on your gun belt just a little bit closer and you want to make sure that roll goes because you're going to get a plus one if you can get your hand closer to your gun. Oh, fuck, I made it okay. You know, it, it's, it's that kind of game where all the planning and... Everything is done, it's rolled on, and it happens. You have to think in a Hackmaster game. You can't just, or Aces and Eights, you can't just bull through and trust to your heroism and storytelling to keep you alive. You like have that. to think. And I, I think it would be a great game for this. That's just me. You though. were about to name another system, though. That wasn't. Oh, I thought the way that you had phrased that, that you were going into another one. No, no. no. Just I mean, I you you okay. obviously know more about games uh, I, I misheard you i thought you but were saying and you say, had another one um no i i had another reason why oh, it was a gotcha. good game um aces and eights is a gorgeous book incidentally oh it is a beautiful i've book. never even seen it, it. is Kinder leather and company mm-hmm. yeah with gold inlay on the wow. cover gold well it's gold paint yeah but i mean it's it's a hundred do we book. have a copy of we, this book do you have one here fuck no okay. i don't it's really i have the cheap copy at home but it's it's a gorgeous book, and Kenzer and Co. is a great. Um, they, they don't take themselves very seriously, which is something I really enjoy about their company. Yeah, go ahead. You got something? Aces and Eights is the opposite of that statement. Aces and Eights is a very serious game. Like it, that game takes itself seriously, and there's humor in the book, mm-hmm. but it is a crunchy. Oh yeah, game. And if uh, if you think GURPS is just not crunchy enough, if oh, you think wow. riffs, if you think riffs is just like a casual afternoon, it, maybe aces <laughs> and eights will be crunchy enough for the, you. The the problem with riffs wasn't that it was not crunchy enough or too crunchy. It was that no one explained how things work. <laughs> I would rather play the hero system with that. than aces and eights. No, I, I disagree. So, but that's. I will say Different. a few things about Aces and Ants. If you want a game with a intricately detailed crop farming and cattle herding system. And wrestling. <laughs> then no. Aces and Ants is for you. If you want a game where combat will take an entire session and you have to calculate each and every modifier. Oh, dear Lord. Aces and Ants is the game for See, you. See, I live for that kind of stuff. It's, if it's, you it's want too detailed for a me. Western sim. That's what it is for. However, I want to. I want to come back. Hey, to something I, I, I want to ask something real quick. What is more detailed, the this Aces and Eight system or a Palladium? Aces, Aces and Eights significantly yeah, okay, so more no, detailed. I have, I have no interest. But it's also better explained. <laughs> oh, if it's better explained, then and I might be willing to look at tells it. Tells you how to play it, which is something that Rifts. God does not. damn it! Okay. No, not just Rifts. Any Palladium game <laughs> has never done. God damn it! Right, if, if, if it explains how to play, and it's not like, and oh, here's yeah. a chart and a spreadsheet, and then you got to know this, and then you got to have that. No, it's. I do it's want actually, to like look into it, it. It is slow paced, but then again, so is the movie. But then you also have to have the right people, right players in a setting yeah. like that. Now, Matthew, I want to come back to something you said a minute ago. You used the phrase Monty Hall to describe yep. this movie. Can you tell me in your words what that phrase means to you? Uh, Monty Hall is you get a lot of loot. The The GM is, is very free with overpowering his loot tables. I don't know. That's, that's, that's not where, I, where correct, I thought you were going to go with it, but that works. I would not agree that this is a Monty Hall movie. I would say that there was a prize at the end of the movie. You could buy a small city for that at the time. But they don't. 
Well, no, they're going to spend it on whores. But well, no, <laughs> I mean, the money true. actually uh-huh. has no purpose whatsoever but to be a MacGuffin, and a MacGuffin is definitely not a Monty Hall game because Monty Hall, it's like, all right, cool. Five minutes into the movie, I found a sword plus one. Yeah. Thirty minutes into the movie, I also have a Holy Avenger axe, kind of thing. Whereas this, they're constantly broke. You see no signs of them getting any kind of equipment. You know what? You're right. Because yeah. it's not just the end goal. It's the it's it's a constant thing. So yeah, I, I'm content to be overruled. You're you're correct. So if this were a Monty Hall game, I've made be... the mistake of running that a time or two where I was like, Oh sure, sure. Mm-hmm. I'll just amp up the bad guys. It's fine. And then I fuck me. Yeah, God yeah I've done that too. Oh that's uh, an early we, DM. Problem. That's an early DM mistake. <laughs> yeah. And you know what? giving treasure is pretty cool because you got this book full of treasure and you want you want to use it all of it you want Mm -hmm. all of it in your game because everything's so cool and then you give it out and you realize and they use it those little assholes (laughs) they're going to use it i would not yeah this is definitely not a monty hall kind of thing so you're not going to have much loot at all the character's going to be scraping for whatever they can get and they frequently do Mm. Aces and eights could work if you're if you're down with that level of grum. Uh, if anyone if, local wants yeah. to do it, I'd be down. I know someone who would be down. Really? Yeah, we'll talk. Are they experienced? Yes. Nice. They are a Kinzer and Company fanboy. Ooh, yeah, I want to meet them. If I were to run this game, uh, hmm. okay, this is this is a <laughs> tough one. Okay, because it depends upon the kind of game that I want to run. Like, do I want to run a gun a game that is just three characters waging wits against each, each other over a grand battlefield? Because that's a very different kind of game if I want to run a gritty gunfight game. Like, what's more important, the guns or the battle of wits? Like, given what the movie is, I'm gonna say it's the wits. Yeah, because it's it's I'd the, have, it's the eyeballs, agree. man. Yeah. For something like that, I'd pull out Burning Wheel. A Burning Wheel is, I mean, it, by at its core, it's like a Tolkienian fantasy game with its basic mechanic. Well, no, you can uh, transfer things yeah, over yeah. from another game. Burning guns. Wheel has a way to build these really complex duels between characters of two or three kind of play duels. And it's a game that makes characters that are so vastly interesting because you follow them based on what the character believes you follow their beliefs and you let the beliefs guide you through play and they frequently bring you into uh conflict with each other mm-hmm. problem with that is there's only one character in this movie that we kind of sort of know his beliefs yeah the others are just money i don't i honestly don't think in any system you're going to be able to play the characters from this movie you can play in the world but I don't think you can play the characters. I think you can. And I have a game for you. What you got? Ba-ba-ba-bum. This is a game that was kickstarted a couple years ago. It is, as many games are, a D&D retro clone. But it's a much more simplified game. And it is called Owl Hoot Trail. Looks good. Now, Owl Hoot Trail can also do westerns with elves and orcs and magic yeah this but, looks like a but you can, uh, like you a can, shadow run in the west you can just ignore the magic and the elves and the orcs because the game itself allows you to play basic archetypes inspired by D brought into a wild west setting the pictures are lovely the problem is it's taking a long time to load on the ipad uh, <laughs> yeah. yeah sorry it's all right uh, how much porn do you have on here? <laughs> Why is it taking so long? I just wiped these. Yeah, I think these Choose are these, these two iPads horn, are ending their lives. I was gonna say these are these are like probably what first first and second uh, one's gen. One's a two and one's a three. Okay. The character has three ability scores: grit, draw, and wits. Yeah. You have skills such as amity and uh, learning, you know, toughness, learn, wild, wilderness. Yeah. Uh, there are powers. I mean, probably skip that. Because you don't need them. Ultimately, you can ignore all of the magic stuff in this game. And Owl Who Trail is a super simple. If you know how to play D anD D, you know how to play this game. It works for me. From from what I can see over over Matthew's shoulder, uh, it looks good. He's not standing near my shoulder. Yeah. <laughs> when <laughs> just so you know, a moment ago, I could see it. <laughs> I hate you. Backpack five dollars, bedroll a buck, bandolier five dollars, woolen blanket three bucks. I'm, I'm just telling you, a hundred thousand dollars, or or even the thousand dollars they were splitting, they were fine. They were fine, see, but they had dollar signs in their eyes. Yeah, you know, all you got to do is give the PCs 
a somewhat realistic but overblown amount of money yeah. and their eyes are going to go wide and they're going to follow whatever bait that you have on that hook. Yeah. I like the gadgeteer class, uh, character class. You could also do Rifts. You absolutely could. Rifts has the New West book. One of and it has the gunslinger, the lawman, the the saloon bum. It's got all these different character classes where if you wanted to, you could take this theme and transport it into whatever setting you wanted. You know, honestly, the theme you you could play the themes just just the themes in Serenity. I mean, you you could transfer this to an awful you could put lot it in, of yeah wagon train of, to the stars of of western yeah. space cowboy kind of feel. There's so many, I know it's it there's so it's many hard to games pick one, to which is why I say Aces and Eights final answer. But <laughs> I, my my I would not run Aces and Eights simply because I find that system to be sluggish. Yeah, I've, I've noticed that you don't like the crunchy ones. I do at times. Yeah, just, just I don't think you've ever liked the crunchy ones. Every least, one I've it, ever brought up, yeah. you've been like, uh, <laughs> you, you do, but at the same time, I mean, generally because all right. One of the things that we talked about way back in the day is like, what would we run for a one shot? I would almost never run a one shot of any crunchy system. Yeah. Because I'm just not going to get the amount of satisfaction out of that one shot no, that I fair. would out of something that moves a lot faster. If, if, if you're doing an evening game, then you don't want to spend six hours making the perfect character. And I'm at the age now where I shy away from crunchy games because I frequently bring new players to the table. And I don't want to have to teach someone a game anymore that is that crunchy. Mm. Now, if it's a game where I was a teenager and I had all the time in the world to pick up that game and read <laughs> oh, it the, and the all the my friends in did your voice, too, oh, then God, that would so be a completely memories. different story. And I'd be like, yeah, we're all going to sit down and play the goddamn hero system because it's going to do what we want to. Yeah. And we can make it do by using the rules. I can't do that anymore. I have to teach new players games and even my existing group of players. If I were to say I want to run a session based, I want to run a mini campaign based on this theme. I have to be able to pitch to them a gaming system that I could teach them in a session. You know, honestly, I have never played a one shot. Really? Like outside of that a surprises con. me. I, I have only spent multi year campaigns. How many of them ended satisfactorily it's usually someone integral to the plot line moved away but yep. i mean the satisfaction of growing a character over years i mean we could have that discussion but it would take up a lot of time um on, honestly I, 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 I have never i have never played these these short games that we keep using hmm. i i've i've always taken part in something with a, a vast lore and a vast realms. Long campaigns are always fun. I I love those. Yeah, I do. I dream of them. <laughs> <laughs> I and then your players exactly fuck it up. <laughs> the players fuck it up, or my schedule fucks it up, or time fucks it up, or me just being an old man, yeah, an increasingly older person, and everyone having kids, jobs, social Life. lives, less of a commitment to the game than me. I was in so a campaign on. once where it lasted so long that. The DM had a baby, um, and then the campaign kept rolling long enough till her baby was old enough to game. That's awesome, and did game with us. We we you know we were very gentle with them, but I'm at the same time, so so envious of that because I no, I mean, so I I understand where you're coming from, but at the same time, it's it's so foreign to my gaming experience, which is guys we are going to game you can just go ahead and quit your church and forget <laughs> about all your hobbies because we're doing this now <laughs> you know okay i would love that realistic question yeah knowing your friends yourself and the vagaries of life that you and your friends all have to account for how many people could you call and set up a weekly campaign that's going to last i couldn't do weekly but I could do bi-weekly. How many people can you call realistically set up a bi-weekly campaign that you know will last two, three years? Six. And that's just off the top of my head. Okay. What gaming system? Anything. Okay. But will they know it as well as you do? No. 
will you have an easier time teaching them Savage Worlds than the hero system? I, I don't mind taking the week. Okay, but... Or even buying the books for them, because that's just the way I do it. It's, it's a huge commitment when I, when I join a game. I'm not sure I believe you. Knowing how you should. knowing uh, the complexity of your schedule mm-hmm. and how hard it has been to get us to meet on any other night outside of things, I I I I, I questioned this. <laughs> <laughs> no, I, I, I could call six people uh-huh. and get a gaming group of at least four. Okay. Now how many of those four could commit every single time for at least two months, three months straight? For at least two months, three months? Straight. Oh, Easily all of them. Uh huh. When you start getting into the three to four years, I okay. I don't want to brag, <laughs> but I'm a very good storyteller, and it's, my okay. my gamers are they they love the craft that I put into it because I spend hours. I go without sleep and I craft these elaborate worlds. Matthew, we run a game. Let's do one. I I don't want to brag here, but I have the same thing going mm-hmm. on here. But but you've problem, done it more often. The problem is. We're adults now, and we have lives. We have things that happen. It's just even I, as (laughs) as a storyteller, even I as a GM, I'm suddenly like, well, you know what? I I I just can't make it tonight. And it used to be like some of the excuses that I use that that the reasons that I'm willing to cancel a game now are my hip hurts. (laughs) Whereas when I was a kid, it was like, okay, I've had two hours of sleep. I'm hungover and I'm bleeding from my ears. Let's game. Right. No, I, I understand what you're saying. Um, I'm just saying that if if I choose to re-embark on one of these, then it is going to happen. I could I could probably yeah, four people. Similar to him, if I if I really wanted to run a game, which I'd like to, I'd like to run a Star Wars game, I could have at least four people show up every other week. I can think of for at maybe, least six months, maybe one motherfucker. I was there. You said, let's do palladium. And I was like, word, let's do it. Even I'm I in. said, all right, let's try it. so let, let's not two. say that you so. can't think of nobody because Dusty, <laughs> you bailed the like le- one no, session the, into a game. With the me. last game. The, hang on. No, Shit's in my happening. De- it's getting real. In up my in here, defense, guys. my fucking father died. So, oh, oh that's damn, my defense. Dude. Okay. You're supposed to All pull right. that out uh, at the end, not at the beginning of the <laughs> argument, man. I'll give you that one. You left me with so many NPCs to play. They all died. I know. <laughs> I wanted to play the Yeti. I loved the Yeti, but my dad died. Come on. All right. Well, we honestly, are... <laughs> I'll, I'll tell you what. Um, I have a lot of other projects, and I'm not getting a lot of sleep. But if you guys want to experience one yeah, of my games. I'd love to. We could put something maybe after... Your relationship. Uh, I don't know if you've announced anything on the <laughs> yeah, on the mic. This month is over. Well, okay. and, and hang on. And also in defense, the other game that I was in with you, <laughs> the guy that the other the, the, where I was where I the, the, had to play the dragon god, pray to the, your dragon god. The guy stopped having it at his house, from what you told me. Like that, just game just ended. He died. Oh, okay. Well, <laughs> so the two oh. games I've been in with you have not been my fault. You know, I rarely come to Dusty's defense, but in Dusty's defense, those are valid, man. <laughs> Fair enough. Okay. Let's make a game happen, guys. We need to make a game happen. I would love yeah, to. In fact, I'd, I'd like to run it. I'd sit down and craft something for you okay. guys. Cool. Yeah. Let's figure this shit out. Yeah. I haven't played in a while. I'll tell you now, Matthew, I'm the worst fucking player. You just got to give me shit to do. That's it. You know? That's why I'm the worst player because I'm a GM. Yeah. Because a GM, I'm always like doing shit in my head. As a player, I need to be able to do shit. And that's 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 my only thing. That's cool. Anyway, we've kind of drifted <laughs> way off. <laughs> no, that's that was good, though. That was a good tangent. <laughs> yeah. I thought it was great. So, yeah, if you want crunchy, Aces and Aces is where it's at. It is, it is the Western gaming system out there. If you want not crunchy. And go- it's just a shorter campaign that you're throwing together because... You watched a movie and you want to share it with your friends. Kind of what the podcast is about. Mm-hmm. We're going to go with yours. It's also a hundred dollars. Well, not for, for the, the paperback. Record. Is that that the 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 gold leaf? Page yeah, it's one, a pretty one. Leather bound because that's what you're going to get. Fucking <laughs> ne- Necronomicon, <laughs> gorgeous. I would love to see it. I would. I'll, I'll, I'll have to go look it up tonight. You, you know, um, Kinzer you know, and Company has a gorgeous book. You, you know the uh, the uh, let's just call it uh, rich people study type B. Yes. Where it's full of books that they've never read, like the Iliad and yeah. the, uh, all that kind of stuff. And they're yeah. done. Yeah, like that. Yeah. <laughs> it, it, looks, it's it looks like gorgeous. That. Yeah. Yep. that is not it. But no, I know, I know, I know. Yeah. Yeah. 
Um, Showing him a graphic novel of mine, but <laughs> I, I I get your yeah. your yeah. motherfucker. Anyway, anyway yeah. yeah. So, so if you want crunchy aces and eights, if you want the opposite of crunchy, I'd go for Owl Hoot Trail. If you want something somewhere in the middle, go for Savage Worlds with Deadlands or Rifts or New anything West. or <laughs> anything you can think of. Cowboys are it, it's been done. I'm sure Cowboys you can find something yeah. done. All right. Well, this does is that honestly one of the easiest yeah, things. This was All good. right. Well, let's not actually wrap out. We have. Uh, we thank got. You, thank you for voting last time, by the way. Yeah, thank you very much. Uh, we have a new set for you to vote on this up and coming. But first, let's talk about the movie that won. Mm-hmm. Our next episode is going to be a tribute to Burt Reynolds. Or as we like to call him, the, mustache. the Magnificent Mustache. We had a bunch of mo- we had four different movies of his that we put on there, and thank God nobody voted for Deliverance. I'm so happy that I mean I know <laughs> Matthew and I we discussed this on the last episode that that is like a perfect gaming movie. It is redneck uh. rapey D and D, and I didn't want to talk about that. And I'm really glad. it would have been weird. Yeah. However, it was one of those movies that you have to mention. We had to put it on there. And nobody voted for Gator either. Uh, we had thirty-eight uh, percent voted for Cannonball Run, and sixty-three percent. I don't actually know how that math works out. But sixty-three <laughs> percent voted for the movie that I'm glad won, which is Smokey and the Bandit. It's classic. That, yeah, that, yeah, that's that, yeah. that'll be fine to do. So Smokey and the Bandit next week. Jackie Smokey Gleason and the Bandit has some great lines in that movie. Smokey and the Bandit will be our next, and now we are going to be putting up voting for the movie after that. Okay, this one I'm excited as fuck about, and y'all better vote right. Otherwise, I'm just well. well tell, I'm just gonna tell them what is voting well, right. The theme is oh, I will. The theme is <laughs> swords and muscles. <laughs> our movies are Death Stalker. Yeah, Scorpion King yeah. with The Rock. A good movie. Yeah. Beastmaster, not so much a good movie. The and, and the, the, the one ferrets, you better the fucking vote for. <laughs> well, you better vote for Deathstalker. But if you don't vote for Deathstalker, you need to vote for Conan the Barbarian. Not what Conan. is best in life? To crush your enemies, see them driven before you, and to hear the lamentation of the women's. Yes. No, you're supposed to say that is good. That Fuck. is good. Fuck, Dusty. I hate you. It's a great movie. I know. And it's it got is. one of my favorite actors in it. What I will reveal later. Are we going to watch the, the full extended version or are we going to watch the theatrical version? I only have the theatrical version, but if you want to pull the uh, full extended let's up. Let's stick on the theatrical okay. version. Yeah. Because there's a speech at the end that he gives to During Subutai. the times when the oceans um, drank Atlantis. Yeah. It's not Mako, man. <laughs> That's my, yeah. one of my favorite yes. actors. Yes. yes. He is amazing. So, yeah, that's what we're going to put up for our next vote. And we once again want to remind you that we have a Discord server where you can join us and chat and ask us questions and share your comments. We engage with you. Well, we have a few people there that are, you know, constantly talking about the movies. And thanks, guys. Yeah, uh, we ben appreciate and it. And Matt, we love having you on there. We've also got. Facebook and yeah. a tip jar Twitter and a tip. Oh yeah, we have a tip jar. Yeah, we guys, would money. you get us enough so we could buy a little Caesar's pizza? It's six <laughs> goddamn dollars, <laughs> and it's the only dream I have ever had about We're putting wasting anything away on the over internet here. ever. <laughs> I <laughs> just want to make enough money to buy a cheap pizza once. You know what? If you if you throw us enough cash on our tip jar, and there's a link in the episode notes, if you throw us enough cash. We'll take pictures of us eating it. In fact, I we, will rub it on my body and you can take pictures. We of will that. record Lord, oh our my. next episode <laughs> slumping on that little delicious, cheesers, delicious pizza. Cheesy, cheesy pizza. <laughs> get all over hot the place. And, get some hot and ready up in this house. <laughs> hot and ready. <laughs> all right, guys. Thank you so much for listening. We'll thank be back you. Uh, not this week, but the week after. Please vote on this next one. This one is important. But as always, Uh, I'm Matthew. And I'm Dusty. And I'm Nathaniel. And we'll see you next time. Thanks for listening to another episode of our show. We're still pretty new to the scene, and we'd love to get your feedback. If you like what you hear, please leave us a review on iTunes with your thoughts. Good or bad, they really help us get the word out. If you want to say hello, drop us a line on all of the usual social media sites. You can find the links right there in the show notes. You can also leave us a comment on our website at havemovieswillgame.com. We look forward to hearing from you. 
Half Movies Will Game is a Breakfast Puppies podcast production, and our episodes are distributed under CC BYND 4.0 license. Our opening theme is Rock and Gravel by Sid Valentine's Patent Leather Kids, with introductory narration provided by Isaac Scher. Thanks again for listening, and we'll see you next time.